Hi, I'm Laura Giles, your host of Modern Animism Radio. We talk about different aspects of life to help you rewild yourself and come back into harmony with nature. And today I have a guest, Mike Oppenheim. Mike's a musician, essayist, and podcast host who likes to eat avocados in his spare time. (laughs) Mike Oppenheim is actually going to share his take on the meaning of life and death. Everything has a yin and a yang side, right? Um, It makes more sense to talk about both sides of the coin. So first, let's take a moment to get here, get grounded, and bring our hearts and minds into sacred space. To the earth who gives us food, shelter, beauty, sensuality, stability, and a firm foundation, I thank you. To the air above that brings us whispers from the other side, oxygen, discernment, detachment, and imagination, I thank you. To the fire that purifies, destroys, and stirs us to create, I give thanks. And to the water that gives us life, cleanses us, and allows us to feel and connect, I thank you. To the human, plant, animal, and mineral ancestors, thank you for all that you do for us that's seen and unseen. To the elders whose lives serve as models on how to walk towards death, I give thanks. And to you, all our listeners around the world, if we inspire you, educate you, arouse you, it makes me so happy. Um, I thank you for for just listening. And um, if that is returned in kind, please consider... Um, telling others about us, reviewing our podcast so that it can reach other people. And feel free to join our private Facebook group if you'd like to connect to our virtual community. If you'd like to interact with us and grow your animus practice, go to patreon.com forward slash pan society where you can become an insider. We offer group ancestral healings, a book club and an online class for those who want to go deeper. So thank you. So let's turn it now to our guest, Mike Oppenheim. Welcome, Mike. Thanks for being here. Hi. Thank you so much for having me on. Sure. I can't wait to talk to you about death. It's, it's, I, I <laughs> thought I was the only one who was obsessed with that. <laughs> <laughs> so your podcast is actually dedicated to death. Um, what inspired you to do that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the podcast is called Coffin Talk, which is obviously like a poor pun on uh, coffee talk and it came from actually, I did uh, volunteered with hospice for about four years. And um, that was sparked by earlier moments in life. When I was very young, my mother used to take me along with her um, to visit this friend who was dying from cancer. And she and the friend and someone else noticed that I had like a very like calm and reasonable approach to like talking to that woman and actually helping her die. And I was too young to understand that I was doing something like that. It was to me just more intuitive to be around someone and and provide them with comfort and love. And then that happened three more times in my youth. Um, Three different friends of my mother's uh, were unfortunately uh, diagnosed with cancer and eventually succumbed to it. And I was with all three. Flash forward through my 20s and most of my 30s, I was not obsessed with death, nor was I around it a lot, but um, I was always comfortable with it. Uh, I think the only thing wor- worth noting would be like when I was 27, I was nearly killed on my bicycle in Portland, Oregon, because a car ran a stop sign. And uh, I just remember the moments leading up to the accident and as it happened and after, at no point was I afraid of dying. Um, that's not to say I was not afraid of all sorts of other things like being paralyzed, losing you know other bodily functions. But uh, so then in my 30s, after... Um, I've always volunteered my whole life and uh, I went through a divorce and I had a lot of free time on my hands, uh, more than I was used to. So I looked into the local volunteer groups and this uh, hospice of the Valley here in Phoenix, Arizona really caught my attention. And so I had to train and it was actually really hard um, just to be a volunteer. And then I started working at a dementia home for four years and then I wrote uh, an essay on it. And the reception for that essay was higher volume than normal. And uh, I realized a lot of people in this culture that I'm a part of, uh, specifically the, I would say the global North or North America at the very least, um, we don't think about death. It's taboo to talk about it. And we therefore almost fear it. uh, And it creates a lot of issues. (laughs) So, so I started a podcast where I decided to interview anyone and everyone. And I would actually love it if you would come on it. Um, Oh, to thanks. talk, yeah, to talk about um, what death means to them, and then more specifically, how an awareness of death affects uh, your your ethics and your morality. Ah, okay. So you never had a fear of death ever? 
No, I've never had a fear of death and I don't really understand why. I just have always, I mean, I can use words and concepts I've read about, you know, I could talk about reincarnation or other things like that, but that's not really the truth. The truth is I just don't fear death. It doesn't scare me. I think it has to happen. And I've always somehow understood that. Um, the few times where I've I've never thought I was going to die, but I've been in situations where I think I'm supposed to think I was going to die. And I think that's mm. just a wiring in my brain. But I, I do know that uh, it's not that I'm afraid of it, but to say that I'm looking forward to it or anticipate it would be absolutely incorrect. Um, you know, I just want to live a long, healthy life, but I'm also extremely curious. I, it's like, we're all playing this board game and none of us have read the rules and none of us especially know how to win the game and what happens at the end of this phase of the game. And that's really what I'm obsessed with. So what was your spiritual background growing up? Did, were your parents also n not afraid of death? Uh, good question. No, I would not say they're not afraid of death, but I would say that I was raised pretty differently for my generation and where I grew up. So I grew up in the Bay Area of California and my parents are really, really into transcendental meditation, which they learned in the 70s. So they taught me to meditate when I was really young. And we always just kind of had this open policy in the house where like nothing is taboo, so to speak. And so we would have a lot of conversations. I have an older brother who also was, you know, interested in philosophy and stuff. And so I wasn't raised... Uh, my, my father is Jewish and I was culturally part of like, I guess, Judaism, but I, I never went to temple. I wasn't bar mitzvahed. And um, I also wasn't raised anything but Christian because my parents aren't. And so I just kind of grew up with this like more Eastern, more almost Vedic or Hindu philosophy, but not actual Hinduism. There's nothing like that. Okay. So did you have experiences within meditation that were, um, well, spiritual Yes, many, many. And uh, what's interesting is the older I get and the more I go back and try to analyze my life, it's like, I, so you know how you try to, um, you try to like rebel against whatever your parents give you. So I spent a lot of time in my youth rebelling against spirituality, rebelling against mm. um, like my parents, you know, encouraging me to be like open and loving. And so I like tried to you know, I, I listened to a lot of punk rock. I got kind of like political. I was into like activism, Che Guevara, a lot of the normal stuff. And uh, to me, that's not really spiritual. While that does serve a purpose and it's, you know, important, uh, the spirituality part of me is deeper than that and just kind of runs through my whole life. And it's basically, um, there's a part of me that actually respects the part in you and the part in everyone else. And even when it's heavily tested, which it has been, I still can't ignore that. Um, and I think that's where I would define my spirituality is that there's a sacredness to all life, animals, plants, minerals, even like I believe rocks and stuff. And it's up to you to discern what to do with that. But it, to me, I feel it. It's there. Yeah. Okay. Did So when you were growing up and you were watching these people die of cancer, did that, um, was that like peaceful for you or what, how, how did that Ooh. work with your curiosity? That's really interesting. I've never thought about that. Uh, no, it was not peaceful. I think the one that stands out the most is the first one. And it was my friend's mother and my mom came home one day and said, Oh, I have some bad news. Your friend's mom, she fell on a, a bike ride a couple of weeks ago and her arm was stiff for two weeks and no one could figure it out. So they gave her a brain scan and she has a brain tumor. And that kind of like informed me like, okay, if I ever get paralyzed or something, I'm going to like assume I have brain cancer. And I kind of like approached it from that childlike, <laughs> you know, vantage point of like cause and effect. But, mm -hmm. but your question mm -hmm. is, is really good. And it's, um, gosh, you know, it's hard for me to go back to that era. I would just say I, I the first time I saw someone die, I was in my thirties. So it, I didn't see her die. I don't think I really made that connection at the time. I, yeah. Okay. So it was more just like this, these people are hurting and I'm just here to comfort them. Yeah. And I think that's fair. And I think I would, now that you mentioned that I would just go back to when I was four, I remember like sticking up for kids I didn't like on the playground for the same reason. Uh, so it's, it's almost okay. like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I have to ask you, um, based on all of that, what is your conclusions about the meaning of life? Great, great question. Um, I believe we are here to learn lessons and I believe that we are uh, we have created the curriculum and the events in our own life that we're supposed to 
have struggles with. So it's like this predeterminism meets free will that makes no sense in any context yet. The more I read about quantum mechanics, the more it seems to make sense. So it's like, you may have decided to be a woman of color in this era, in this century, in this place, but you obviously can't control like other outside influences and factors in everyone else's life, but that's the experience you chose to have. And so like when something bad happens in that experience, it's not that you wanted something bad to happen. It's that you wanted an exam. Um, and, and so that's a test. And so I believe we face personal tests and that's the meaning of life, but I don't believe it's a pass fail. I just believe it's the experience of being tested and the experience of reviewing your own results after the test are what make life thrilling, exciting, and incredibly meaningful. So it's like, okay, I want to go hiking. So I'm here for the experience. And if I fall down a cliff, then that's just part of it. Ex yes. As, as harsh and weird as that sounds. <laughs> yeah, I would say that's a good analogy. <laughs> um, so the whole point is just to have the experience? I think so. And I'm actually basing this a lot on recency bias because I had a guest who was a past life hypnotist. And she said, mm -hmm. overwhelmingly, every person she ever worked with in like a 10 or 15 year career said basically the same thing when they were under hypnosis, which is, I just didn't have enough experiences. Like, so the reason these, these souls, if you believe in that, keep coming back. And again, I'm saying if you believe, because I'm really just, I'm very open-minded to it all. But, but uh, that idea does gel with me that like, you just want experiences like the experience of love wouldn't be love if you didn't have the experience of if hate is the opposite of love hate or whatever word you want to use for that but like all concepts can only exist with a spectrum or a binary opposite mm -hmm. um, yeah and that's really ironic too because i'm a past life therapist as well oh, and wow. i would say that yeah <laughs> so maybe you're meant to hear that today i don't know i would say exactly <laughs> the same thing yeah wow totally. wow that's fascinating yeah. Well, I won't interview you on your own podcast, but I am dying to hear some of your stories. So. <laughs> yeah. So um, I guess then pain is just part of it. Bad stuff. Um, yeah. Because because if, if it's, you know, like you say, if the you can't have love without hate or indifference, then you if to have a full life would be to have the spectrum of experiences. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's I use the term recency bias because it's like my current like crutch obsession but um but it really is interesting to me that like if i didn't I'm, I'm in a second marriage and i'm very happily remarried and i have a brand new daughter with my wife and if i had not experienced the pain and the struggles and all the issues in my first marriage it, it wouldn't have worked this way and i wouldn't be grateful the way i am like my a lot of my gratitude comes from struggle and how i dealt with what i perceived as suffering so if a person um, doesn't, is, is not very self-aware or other aware and is just sleepwalking through life, then, then they're not going to get that. Yes, I really, and to be bluntly honest, I think the majority of humans I interact with uh, in life are doing that and it's a little sad to watch. Yeah, yeah, because I think life can be super rich if you're just paying attention. Even exactly. to the stuff you don't like. Definitely. And that was actually, I mentioned that I've, you know, I've been catching up and listening to your podcast and you said that in, in the episode on names and stuff, you really got to that. Hmm. So is love just a, a natural part of that? Or is that something that we have to cultivate or where does love fit in? Does it fit in? Good question. I definitely would say love is everything. It's the, the being the beginning, the middle the end. And it's, the only thing that can save you. And it's the only thing you're really looking for. And I think it's the only thing that isn't a desire, but is actually, um, it's like we look externally for love, but the love should be coming internally. And that's something mm -hmm. that I'm cultivating and working on. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not there, you know, but uh, yeah, I think love is definitely the key. And uh, as corny as it sounds like the Beatles really just tried to hit that same note in a few different songs, but I, I definitely mm -hmm. got it as a kid listening to them. So how was it that we got separated from it if it's inside? Great question. My immediate answer would be the ego, that we are a being. So I like the idea of like spirit, mind, body. And the mind is very important. Just like you need a steering wheel in a car, you need your ego because it's going to be in charge of orienting and steering you through life. Um, you know, you need sustenance. You need uh, to figure out where to sleep at night, things like that. 
And then the heart, the heart has no interest in any of that, but that doesn't mean the other things aren't relevant. So the heart is like the anchor. And when you live in your heart, the ego follows suit and so does the body. But when you live in the ego, the heart is sublimated and the body is probably actually raised, exalted. And when you live in the body of which I've never been able to do, I'm not sure what happens, but, uh, <laughs> but I, but I don't think that's the same as living in the heart. Hmm. Okay. So these sound like, um, ideas. Is this something that you live or is it just some, like, this is what I strive for, but it's not actually in my day-to-day -day life. It is definitely what I live, but it is only what I live since um, what I consider to be the greatest tragedy of my life occurred um, in 2017. And so my, uh, my son from my first marriage and I were separated, um, not legally and not through situations that I approved of. And I was given virtually no options, but one of the options was to fight, 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 attack, attack, use lawyers, try to blah, blah, blah. And uh, the other option, which seemed much more obvious and immediate was to give up completely and live from my heart and not hope for the best, but assume this is the best. And so I am practicing that. It is not easy, but I am doing it. And it's why I actually have decided to open up about that after five years and talk about it with you or anyone else, because I feel like um, everyone suffers and everyone has a different, what they call the tragedy of their life. And, you know, when you're 12, it might be like your favorite restaurant closed <laughs> or the ice cream spill on the floor. But as we get older, we collect these experiences. And I think the really hard ones are the best tests and the most important tests and the tests that we really get to like fulfill ourselves with. So, so yeah, so my answer is yes, I do practice it but I can't tell you that I'm a results oriented person with it. I'm not looking for it to magically change mm -hmm. my life. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we have to be tested because if we're not, then we can't really say what is ours and what isn't. It is just an idea. Yeah, definitely. So what's the meaning of death? The meaning of death is that without time and without pressure, no decision is necessary and your life would be incredibly boring and uninteresting. And even to yourself, it's like, you know, I've thought about it. Like what if you had like every superhero power you could have, including uh, you're never going to die. You know, the, the only genre in fiction that really touches on this is the idea of the vampire and these vampires don't seem very happy. Um, <laughs> and so, and so I think that death is very important because it is, as we get older, and I'm assuming this is true for you, but um, we revere death more and we revere life more and we pay attention more to death. Like when I was a kid, oh, that person died. Okay, you know, like whatever. But now like celebrity deaths don't affect me because they're celebrities. They just remind me that time does its thing and we're all gonna go. And so like, as I get older and maybe it's just the product of social media and the internet, I'm more like, conscious of death all the time. And it really helps me. It really like helps me. Uh, I want to help people cross the street. You know, I want to help someone with their groceries. Like, it's just weird. It makes me want to help people more so that there's just a little less perception of suffering in their life. Yeah. I think that makes it um, more precious, makes life more precious. And, and I love the way you said that because I never thought of it that way before, but yeah, that, that pressure that, you know, this is not going to last, I think does make things more precious and, and does make us more mindful. So how do we prepare for this? That's a great question. And I do actually have a pretty good answer for that. Um, think about it and think about the people you think of as enemies, whether they're people you've never met who you hate politically or they're people who you've like, they hurt your friend or even more immediate, they hurt you they're not your enemies. And as you get close to death and as you die, that will be your only regrets in my opinion. Um, again, going back to that car accident, because I did think I might die that day. The first thing I did when I was in the hospital recovering was I took out my phone and I called the one person who I had said, don't ever talk to me again, pretend that I'm dead. 
I never want to speak to you. And I hope like, you know, I never encounter you again. And this person was someone I had dated. They had really like hurt me. And I said those words because I meant them. And then I felt so bad for saying them. And I just remember thinking the whole time I was getting a CT scan in the hospital. I'm like, the second I'm able, I'm going to call this person and and make sure I undo what I said, because it's not true. And the thought of them going the rest of their life, thinking that I hated them when I died was like soul crushing. So yeah, Mm -hmm. I think, I think, um, you know, it's very hard to deal with geopolitics. The, The global situation is presented to us differently than ever before and everyone and their mother has an opinion. And I think that those are also tests. And I think it's really important to develop compassion and tolerance and awareness of others. And again, not to like uh, blow smoke your way, but you do seem to really get this. And and that's what I, I like about your podcast. I think you're really trying to help people do that. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah I, um, we have a ritual for that, for the dying when um, what you do is, absolve everybody from everything and hopefully people don't wait until they're dying to do it so they can do it on both sides but i think yeah. it's so healing to end that way you know just you know for for everything you've done for everything that you did i didn't know about for everything you know whatever it is i forgive you and let's just go in peace but i think you can do that every day you know yeah i mean especially it's autumn it's time everything's dying you know have a ritual and do it right now <laughs> why wait <laughs> So um, I imagine you saw lots of people from different faiths uh, transition during your time in hospice. And does a person's spiritual path make a difference in how they pass? Good good question. Um, You know, in my case, it's a little harder to answer that because it was a dementia ward. So most of the people Uh, who were dying were not really there, but some were. And so I'm trying to think of those ones. And actually, the one who stands out the most to me was a priest who was in there for like seven months, which is very rare hospice. First of all, legally, it's only supposed to be six months. And Mm -hmm. secondly, usually it's one to three months. And in the case of where I worked, it was usually like within a week. Um, So this person, this guy, he was in the back of this 12 bedroom house that I volunteered at. And he was there just forever. And we got so used to him and he was so warm and he was so nice and he had dementia. So he didn't remember you. So he would kind of like always be warm and nice to you the way he would first greet someone and his wife would come in and she'd just be like, I wish you guys could like have heard his lectures and his sermons because he was so different. And like, you know, I read his obituary after he died and he was, and and yes, I feel like his death was by far the most peaceful of anyone I saw there. Hmm. Because of um, the way he lived his life. Yeah. Because he was confident in his union with love and, and God and mm. all that. And again, this is where I get, it's interesting to me you don't have to believe in God. I am sure atheists can die in peace. It's mm-hmm. just that you have to be at peace with atheism. <laughs> mm-hmm. So do you think um, morality and goodness matter in the afterlife then? I think they, uh, I have three answers to that. And uh, the first one is, yes, it. I have this, I have a belief, but it's just that it's a belief. But I believe that the, the afterlife is not, the main life and nor is this one i actually think the dream state is the most real reality of all of them and i think that's why they're so confusing to us and so i think the um what we call the afterlife is like a waiting room where you review the lessons and then you make your plans for the next life but i don't think that the the thing that is living dies and comes back and dies and comes back. I think the thing that is living is timeless and exists in a timeless space. And so I know this sounds so esoteric and out there, but it's, it's really what I think. And so it's, it really doesn't matter on the cosmic level, but it feels so intense here and it matters so much here that I think that's the ultimate lesson is how do you coexist with other co-creators who aren't creating what you would create. So how do you, what's the point of being good then? And how do you tell your kids don't, don't beat up the little boy down the street? This I I think is kind of interesting, but um, your guilt and your conscience will eat you and get you and it will get you at the end if it doesn't get you in the middle. And, uh, Addiction and substance abuse to me is not at all always the same, but I think a certain amount of it is entirely dedicated to people who can't uh, cope with their own conscience for 
admitting to themselves that they've hurt other people. So I, I will, I will, it's not that I would, I will tell my children, um, you should be good to others because it feels good and it makes everyone feel better. And that's a better solution to your problems than being right or inflicting pain or doing what you think, uh, you should do. So, so I do think it matters, but I don't think ultimately you get punished. That's a very important part of my philosophy. I think that's an important distinction that it doesn't matter ultimately, but it matters here because we share the planet with people. <clears throat> so what about self-destruction and suicide? You know, that's been my um, favorite subjects of all time to consider. Um, that's actually to me, almost more relevant than the three uh, women who died from cancer in my youth. The other event that sent me just on this crazy life mission was my best friend's father committed suicide when we were both 17. And he was like a second father to me. He took me to my first football game. He was just like magnanimous and full of love. And um, because it's a friend, I'm not going to get into the details, but he took his own life and it really really, really um, messed with me. And to this day, I have a few friends who are suicidal and they're comfortable talking to me about it because I, I've told them since the first time they admitted it, you know, it, I think talking about it will help you not do it. So just consider me that guy. You can talk to me anytime you want. I'm never going to get worried. I'm not going to phone your parents or someone else. And I'm not going to certainly going to report you because I do think that suicide is an option. Um, and I think it's a safer option than giving into whatever is pain, giving you so much pain that you were to hurt others. So in other words, if you were like, okay, I'm just going to take the most obvious example ever because everyone overuses it anyway. Imagine if the reason like Hitler went on his Holocaust is because he was suicidal. And instead of just turning off the lights, he had to stay alive. And then he did that. I'm not saying that's true. I'm not trying to bring him up. I'm trying to more get at this idea that like, sometimes we don't really know how much pain someone's in and it's not easy to watch someone be suicidal. And I think it's even harder to have them end their life. But I think that if we were to change the dialogue and the narrative, at least in, in our culture about it, it would behoove us very well. I think um, I, I just, I, I know that this is like, opinionated and strong but i think a lot of these like mass shootings for example are people who are like deeply suicidal and they don't understand that and it and it gets externalized and then and then sadly of all they end up committing suicide anyway you know mm -hmm. yeah i think that if we change the dialogue around from the judgment about it it would be a really different situation yeah, because people yeah. are in pain you know, if that's the only way that you can think of to get out of pain. That's a very sad situation. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's what's so hard about like having compassion is if you're going to have true compassion, it means you're going to have compassion for everyone. There's not like this person doesn't get my compassion because they crossed the line. Like that's, right. that's not compassion. So again, I'm stressing this so that no one thinks I'm, you know, some righteous person. It's not easy, nor do I do it effectively all the time, but I really try my hardest, especially with geopolitics, to just look at like, you know, the horrendous failures of government all across the world, including our own, and just, I try to have compassion. And I think what you just said nails it, which is if we had changed the dialogue 40, 50 years ago, I think a lot of people who choose power and then abuse it are deeply, deeply depressed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think what a lot of people want at the end, though, is to feel like their life has meaning, whether that's a suicide or however it comes to an end. Um, and how do you know, then, if your life had meaning, if it really is just about an experience? Yeah, that's deep. Um, yeah, and I think, so that what, what I found really interesting about it is you said, I think a lot of people uh, want to feel like their life had meaning. And I think that is true, but I think that might in itself be a rabbit hole. Like, um, you know, to go, to go back to like the, the essential Buddhist idea of like all desires are the same, you know, whether it's a desire for, uh, sex to be high, to overeat, you know, whatever it is, it's all because you think externalities are going to fulfill you. And so I think that the idea of my life has to have meaning is, is a similar problem. And I know for me, it was because when I was younger, I was really 
obsessed with like music. And so I decided to dedicate my life to music and I became a musician. And then five years into it, I was experiencing some success, not nearly as much as I had hoped for. And I remember like it started to become painful. It was like now my own pursuit of excellence was actually my biggest problem in life. <laughs> and so uh, yeah. my dad, yeah, my dad took me aside and he said, you don't look happy when you're on stage. Why don't you just quit? And I needed someone to give me permission to quit. You know, I was young, I was 23. And, uh, and so I did. And then I ended up playing in a band for the next five years that was a totally different band and it was just fun and I had a great time. And then I, you know, gravitated away from that into writing. So. Hmm. Yeah. So many traps, mm -hmm. um, uh, which another one could be, th th you don't hear about this so much now, but um, it's still there. So for people who want the fountain of youth, either through plastic surgery, immortality, cryogenics, however that shows up. Um, what do you think of that? And what would you say to those people? Hmm. I think uh, <laughs> sounds like mean and sort of passive aggressive relax. Um, I don't know. There's, it's hard. I, I, I'm reticent to like give what I would say to people. Cause that's kind of what I'm trying to undo now is like this oh. life of like, yeah, I, it's not that it's a bad question. It's not that it's unfair. It's just, I, I really don't know. I think what I really just want to tell every person is try going a week choosing love over every other emotion when it comes so like whatever your problem is or your many problems um you being of course fictitious uh every time those dark or unhappy thoughts come up try to think of a loving solution and try just try for a week and i think it'll start to stick and then i think you'll be less materialistic dri materialistically driven um i think it's a natural consequence i'm actually uh this is random but uh you know, psilocybin, the um, active ingredient in magic mushrooms is now becoming legal in a lot of places in America and it mm -hmm. already is in other places in the world. And they're proving that it like really helps uh, PTSD um, and stuff like that. And what I find hilarious about this is that it's going to become legalized to the point where Coca-Cola and Budweiser will start producing it because that's what they do with everything. And so ironically, I believe that this materialistic consumer driven capitalist venture of selling psilocybin to the masses is going to lead to people taking psilocybin, which inevitably erodes materialism. So I see like, no matter what, like all things are moving right now towards a much gentler and safer and nicer world earth. And I, and I really believe that I just see like rising, rising tides for movements of like less harm towards animals, you know, more cultivation of plant-based materials and, you know, even McDonald's to sell products recently stopped using plastic in their toys <laughs> and mm. like McDonald's or hate McDonald's, they're doing it because they care about their reputation and the reputation that sells now is a consideration for the environment. Mm -hmm. I never, I never saw that coming. <laughs> mm hmm yeah. You said a lot of things today that um, I've either not heard said in that way or just not ha heard that at all. So if somebody was trying to figure out, um, it's like, what is he talking about? <laughs> or, mm -hmm. you know, or inspired by something that you, you've said and they want to find their own truth about death, um, what suggestions would you have for them? Okay. Well, first of all, because I just mentioned it, I would strongly encourage people who have a good physical constituency to wet their toes in mind altering substances. But I want to make this huge, huge caveat with the assistance of someone who's experienced and only if it's legal and safe. I, I actually think that doing something that's illegal in your culture and being afraid while you do it will, will horrendously affect it. So my example now is that I flew to Ecuador where it's legal to take plant medicine called ayahuasca. And I had an experience five years ago that absolutely fundamentally changed me forever. I will never go back to the way I was before that. And I don't think everyone needs to try ayahuasca. I don't think, as a matter of fact, I would strongly urge a lot of people to never try it. <laughs> but, um, but I think if you're curious and you listen to what I said today and you want to glimpse that again, in a safe legal environment, preferably with someone who, you know, has a good, psychological mind with you um i think it would be good to take a small dose and to see how that may or may not open your heart now meditation would be the much easier much more legal and much safer way to do that 
but I feel like it's a little unfair because my parents taught me to meditate when I was 13. And so I've just been on autopilot meditating for, um, I just turned 40. So 27 years. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and I would say that without that ayahuasca experience, I still would be who I am today, but I think the process would have been slower and different. I think that if you, uh, participate in those ceremonies with people who are also seekers and full of love, they can work. But I, but I would just to make sure I <laughs> say it right, uh, because it's going out on the internet, meditation a hundred percent will cure everything for every soul that's struggling, but it doesn't cure you the way you think it will. And it doesn't cure you in any timeline that you're going to be comfortable with. It's, it's, it's really like a long, slow process. I tell people that, uh, Meditation to me is like making a candle. The way you make a candle is you dip a wick in a hot tub of wax. You lift it in the air and you let it dry. You re-dip it. You lift it in the air and you let it dry. And it takes forever. But every Mm -hmm. time you dip it, it comes back with a little more wax. And then eventually one day you have a candle. So I would say that when you meditate, you enter the space of your heart. And the longer you sit there and don't judge it and don't expect results, the more you will start to feel an inherent bias towards doing good and being good. Awesome. I think, you know, life could be that simple as if we just kept focusing on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's hard. I think, you know, COVID was a missed opportunity for a lot of people because it was a chance to actually start meditating every day. You know, most people I talk to, they're like, ah, I don't have time. I get up at seven, I slam the snooze button, or I mean, the alarm button, I take a shower, I, I grab coffee to go and I run to the office, I get home, my kid has soccer practice, you know, blah, blah, blah. But like with COVID, there was actually this like real opportunity for many people to cultivate a private or with their family meditation practice. And and maybe some people did. So I I shouldn't say it was a missed opportunity, but I certainly based on the anger and outrage that I perceived from people, it seems to have not helped people see that, that it was a real chance to change your career, your life work balance, and especially your time. Yeah. Well, I hope people are listening to that today and make a change today. So thanks so much, Mike. Our guest is Mike Oppenheim. And how do we get in touch with you and check out your podcast? Oh, great question. Um, Just go to my website, mikeyop.com, M-I-K-E-Y-O-P-P, like peter.com. And uh, everything's there. Yeah. I also have novels and stuff. So whatever people want. Oh, nice. So thanks for joining us, guys. Don't forget to leave a review for the podcast. Also check us out on Facebook, YouTube, and TikTok if you're on any of those social media platforms. I'm Laura Giles. See y'all next week.